Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on uh, the social protection indicator for Asia, tracking developments and social protection. Um, today, um, we will be uh, sharing with you um, the analysis done in, uh, on social protection programs in 26 countries in Asia. As you know, over the last two years, uh, COVID has highlighted the importance of social protection uh, to support people during crisis. This, it has also, however, highlighted and exposed some of our gaps in the social protection systems here in Asia. And I will just name a few because uh, this will relate to our objectives. The first one is in terms of coverage and adequacy. And we have seen uh, how the crisis exposed the lack of coverage of the missing middle, the informal economy, uh, workers in the informal economy, as well as the urban poor, for example. The second one is in terms of the capacity to respond to shocks um, in a quick and effective and adequate manner. And the last one is in terms of the lack of evidence and data that we have uh, available for informed decision making. And that brings me to the webinar's objectives. Uh, today's webinar aims to share the report's findings. It will also draw lessons for how social protection can be supported and expanded in Asia. And it will identify concrete ways forward in strengthening data collection anal and analysis for social protection programming in Asia. I will now go on to the next slide um, to share with you some of the housekeeping rules. So before we start, uh, just for you to note that we will be sharing in the chat box the executive summary of the report. Uh, we also will have a question and answers uh, session after our presentations. So please do share your questions and uh, um, uh, in the, the Q&A, which is located at the bottom. Uh, also, please, if you have a question that is for a specific uh, person, please indicate to whom you want it to go to. Um, and then finally, um, we have an Asia Pacific Social Protection online community. Uh, which uh, can uh, provide you information on these types of events. So please do join our online community at socialprotection.org. And now I will just quickly go on to introduce our fabulous uh, group of panelists today joining us for the webinar. Uh, uh, let me introduce, start by myself. Um, uh, Jessica Owens, I'm the Regional Advisor for Social Policy at UNICEF uh, at the Regional Office in Kathmandu for South Asia. And I will be moderating today's webinar. We will then follow with an opening remarks by Wendy Walker. Um, she is the Chief of the Social Development Thematic Group, uh, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at the AEB, and she's co-leading the implementation of ADB strategic operational priority on addressing the remaining poverty and reducing inequalities. Uh, next, please. We have two speakers. Uh, first is Babkin Babajanian, uh, he's an uh, associate professional lecturer at the London School of Economics. He teaches courses on design and delivery of social protection and evidence informed policy design. He has uh, is experienced in policy oriented research analysis, operational work in social protection, social development and local governance. He will be joined by Nuno Punya, who is an economist 
um, who has over 20 years of experience in social protection and has been working with uh, the ILO currently as the senior social protection specialist of the Decent Work Technical Support Team for East and Southeast Asia. Next, please. We will have two discussants joining us today. Uh, the first is Ludovico Carraro, uh, who uh, has 25 years of experience in development and specializes in poverty analysis and social protection. He has been providing technical assistance in design and implementation of many social protection programs in Asia and Europe. And we will also have Enki Biamba, who is uh, working as a professor at the National University of Mongolia, and who, uh, apart from the teaching, also provides uh, 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 is leading and supervising a number of qualitative and quantitative studies, engaging in analysis, reporting to and advising the government of Mongolia in areas such as population and development, fertility, social protection issues, including poverty, disability, and aging. Next, please. And finally, we will be having closing remarks uh, by Marcus Ruck, He's a specialist on social protection at the ILO Decent Work Technical Support Team for East and Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And he will be, uh, and he has experience uh, in South Asia as well as Southern Africa, as well as Central and Eastern Europe. Um, now, let me pass on for our opening remarks to Wendy Walker. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks everybody for joining the webinar today. Um, and to Jessica for your moderation and socialprotection.org for, for hosting. Um, this is the second of two sessions which share the findings from the social protection indicator reports um, we've recently completed on Asia and Pacific. Last week, we had the webinar on the Pacific findings, and it's available on the Social Protection uh, Org website. The effort has been led by my colleague, Mikkel van der Auer, uh, and this webinar, which is more focused on data collection, is co-organized with our colleagues at the ILO. Um, today, we're going to share the findings from the Asia report. As Jessica just said, it covers 26 countries and assesses the level of resources invested in social protection, as well as the value of benefits, coverage, and distribution of expenditures in terms of poverty, gender, and disability. But in addition to presenting the SPI trends, in this round of the data collection, and the reports, we developed several special thematic chapters focusing on the social protection response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, data on disability, constraints and opportunities in producing and analyzing social protection data and statistics at the national and regional level, and anticipating the future of social protection systems and programs in Asia. So it's, it's a more uh, uh, complete uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of, of chapters. And for today's session, after sharing the main findings, we want to delve deeper into the special chapter written by our colleagues from ILO, Nuno Kunha and Valeria Nestorenko, on the constraints and opportunities in producing and analyzing data and statistics. Uh, this topic will be the point of departure also for our two discussants, Ludovico Carraro and Ngsegseg Biamba. Um, there are important challenges and substantial gaps in the production and in compilation of social protection data in Asia and improvements are necessary to enhance monitoring and evaluation. And effective monitoring and evaluation systems are key for the development of strong social protection systems and supporting policy and program development. So we are um, actively exploring the possibility of more, of conducting more coordinated data collection in countries um, in the next round of uh, SPI already with ILO going forward and, and looking forward to that collaboration continuing. So with that very brief introduction, I hand back over to Jessica and thank also Marcus Rook for his comments at the end and wish everybody a very good session. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, without further ado, we will go to Babakin, who will be presenting us the findings. Over to you.
Okay, um, thank you very much for your introduction, Jessica, and for your opening address, Wendy. Um, and it is my pleasure to share with you the results of the ADB Social Protection Indicator exercise that we have just completed. And um, in, in this session, I will go through some of the key findings um, and highlight the implications of these findings for uh, policy development in the region. So first, let me introduce, uh, let, let me explain what the SPI stands for and give you an outline of this presentation. Um, so the ADB has developed um, the SPI um, index uh, indicator uh, many years ago. So the first SPI was used in 2005, uh, and it has been using the SPI um, as a tool for monitoring social protection development in the region. Um, the SPI has been used by the ADB, uh, other international organizations, national governments, and other stakeholders widely. Now, what the SPI does, it captures the magnitude of social protection expenditure per each intended beneficiary. And it's relative to a country's level of per capita income. Now, this indicator is different from a traditional indicator of total share of expenditure as a percentage of GDP that we normally use in, in, in tracking social protection. But the two measures are complementary. Uh, and by introducing the SPI measure, uh, we believe that um, there could be greater precision in, in the way we capture different dimensions of uh, social protection expenditure. Now, um, the key unit for assessing the SPI results are the intended beneficiary groups. And these groups are defined by, by, by the study uh, depending on their eligibility for a particular social protection category program. So for example, the intended beneficiary groups for health insurance would be the entire employed population. Uh, and the intended beneficiary group uh, for the uh, for pensions or assistance to the elderly would be the population aged uh, 60 years and above. Now, um, in this presentation, I will also share the, the comparative results that are available for, um, for, to, for, for the period starting from 2009 um, to 2018. Um, and just to give you an idea about what is coming in this presentation, so first I would outline the, the key SPI results for 26 countries drawing on the, uh, on the data from two, uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, then I will uh, cover the depth or the value of benefits, and, and this is the actual average value received by actual beneficiaries, as well as the breadth of coverage, which is the share of actual beneficiaries in the total intended beneficiary population. I will also talk about the, uh, the poverty, gender, and disability dimensions of the SPI and close the presentation by outlining some uh, policy responses to COVID-19 that we uh, were exposed to do additional data gathering as part of this exercise. I realized that there's quite a lot in this session, um, and I've been told that this presentation will be then available publicly on socialprotection.org, so you will have an opportunity to actually go through the, the, the graphs and through the presentation again and, and study it at your own time. So let's just look at the overall picture of SPI in Asia. In 2018, the average SPI in 26 countries was at four. So that's 4% of GDP per capita, but I'll be using just the numerical indicators. Now, what does this mean? Now, the, it's, it's an aggregate indicator. It's average um, for 26 countries. And obviously, um, the, there is a huge variation in the way this plays out depending on a country. So for example, in Japan, Japan has the highest SPI, which is 11.7, uh, and you have a low SPI in, in Lao PDR, which is, 0.9. Now, to compare these with the with a traditional measure of um, social protection expenditure as a percentage of GDP, uh, so that measure was at 5.2% of GDP 
in 2018. So usually we expect that the trends um, expressed in the SPI value and in the, the, the share of GDP expenditures are usually um, consistent, uh, although the SPI, are slightly, the SPI values are slightly lower than the, uh, the, the, the share of GDP values. Now, what do we conclude based on this? A picture is that obviously there is a wide variation in the region and, and some factors that explain this variation um, are they include income, countries income and obviously we, we know this by looking at some of the high income countries such as um, Japan, Republic of Korea, um, uh, Singapore where you have um, uh, that, that have achieved high spending in terms of the SPI values and have um, and have impressive GDPs. Now, other factors, for example, demographic structures, so the presence of, of, of persons um, at 60 years and above is a key factor that affects the, um, the increase in expenditures. So that's manifested in, uh, in, in, in old age pensions. As well as we found that the extent of inequality is an important variable. So for example, countries that are more equal tend to spend more on social protection as opposed to countries that are not equal. So one can explain this by the fact that maybe fragmented societies are less able to, um, to develop a social contract to be able to redistribute resources through social protection. And let's not forget that it's not just all about income, but it's also about the policy direction, vision and context in particular countries. And we do know that uh, so countries, so lower uh, middle income countries, such as, for example, uh, the Kyrgyz Republic um, that has a relatively low income, but it spends quite a substantial share of its, um, of its budget on social protection. So commitment and and an overall um, appreciation of social protection in the policy domain is a key factor that, uh, that influences the level of expenditure. Now, this is a, uh, as a, as a, as a this graph portrays the, uh, the, GD, G, uh, the SPI spread by country. Um, and um, as you can see, it starts with high income countries, uh, and then we cluster upper middle income countries in the middle, as well as low middle, uh, middle income countries on the right side of this uh, chart. So uh, you will have an opportunity to study this in more detail uh, after the session. Now, uh, looking at the progress, uh, this, is, this is one of the key components of this exercise. And it was really interesting to be able to monitor the progress um, across 24 countries, because the comparable data was available only for 24 countries. Um, and what we observed is that there was, there was progress from 3.3 in 2009 to 4.1 in 2018. And these rise in expenditure was mainly driven by the expansion of social insurance. Uh, and we do know that um, health insurance schemes and pension schemes, contributory pension schemes have actually expanded in the last 10, 15 years across the region. And this is the main driving force behind the, uh, the, the, the increase in, in the SPI value. Now, we also observe that the, the spending in Asia, in average terms, it is quite moderate, it's quite modest. And, uh, and we, we concluded that the spending did not outpace the growth in GDP, uh, and it was uh, lagging behind, uh, and countries could have spent more money on social protection uh, relative to the, 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 the growth um, of GDP, but they didn't. And this is a finding that was also documented in regional studies by OECD. Um, social protection really in Asia has been primarily triggered by large crises. So uh, if you look at the the, 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 the Asian financial crisis in 1997, the, the, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and just recently the COVID-19 pandemic, it's clear that these events triggered major spikes in social protection in the region, but the overall growth remains stable and there is no um, substantial investments in the post-crisis period. 
And one conclusion here is that the, the rate of growth investment in social protection in the region uh, needs to be accelerated in order for countries to be able to, uh, to achieve sort of key objectives of uh, building comprehensive systems, enhancing coverage, and uh, improving benefit adequacy. So if you can, uh, if you see on, um, on, this, on this graph, you can see that, so the average for 24 countries, the major spike here was from 2009 and 2012, and that was the, the aftermath of the, uh, the crisis uh, in, in Asia. After that, uh, the growth remains quite uh, moderate. Now, let's just look at specific categories, and these are um, social insurance, social assistance, and active labor market programs, and see how um, how um, the SPI value is manifested in, ac across these different categories and programs in Asia. In social insurance, the SPI improved uh, from 2.3 to 3.1. As I said, social insurance dominates spending um, in all country groups, um, and this was the major driving force behind the, the rise in expenditures in Asia um, in, the last, um, in the last 10 years. So the, 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 the efforts to establish universal health and, and pensions have been absolutely um, uh, impressive and, 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 uh, and, and important for driving social protection developments in the region. And you have countries um, that um, have combined uh, contributory and non-contributory financing mechanisms as a way of, uh, of achieving uh, universal coverage. At the same time, what we can also observe from our data is that in, in half, at least half of the countries in our study, there are huge uh, coverage gaps in pensions and health insurance. Uh, and this is a very worrying finding, and this is something that needs to be urgently addressed. So if you look at, uh, at this graph, you can see that so the major, uh, the, the, the major um, noticeable difference is in social insurance. So for other uh, categories, such as social assistance here in green and um, labor market programs in orange, you can see that um, the, 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 the line is rather flat. Um, so moving on to social assistance, um, so the, 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 the SPI remained at uh, 0 0.9 between the, 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 uh, these years. Uh, but the major force behind the, 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 um, uh, be, be behind the SPI value in social assistance was uh, where the um, was the, the welfare assistance program, which which comprises of cash and in kind transfers. Um, in addition, assistance to the elder, elderly, which is uh, obviously these are the non contributory social pensions. Um, they also play a prominent role in providing support to the population. So those two programs were the more uh, visible in the social assistance portfolio across the region. Um, now, we do know that social assistance in Asia has a very, very important role to play in reducing poverty vulnerabilities. Uh, but the fact is that um, it needs to be strengthened. The coverage gaps need to be addressed uh, to ensure there is minimum income security for all. Um, and uh, and the, the SPI value highlights the fact that social assistance remains at a rather low point. Finally, uh, active labor market programs. Again, these are the most underdeveloped programs in Asia. So the, the SPI hasn't changed across uh, the years studied. Um, uh, the more prominent programs here are um, cash and food for work programs. Um, so Bangladesh is, is known of, 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 of a plethora of very um, interesting innovative programs, um, as well as skills development and training programs. So countries like uh, Singapore, Bhutan, Cambodia uh, have very strong programs in that area. And again, our conclusion is that strengthening the uh, labor market programs can uh, significantly, significantly help um, disadvantaged, low-skilled workers um, to be able to gain uh, better employment and better incomes. 
So I've concluded the overall presentation of the SBI according to, to categories and programs. And now I would like to give you a, an idea about the depth and breadth. Um, and as I said earlier, the depth is the, the, the amount of expenditure per each actual beneficiary. And the, the, the breadth is, 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 is the coverage uh, that is based on um, the, the, the disaggregation of the SPI values across the region. So in order for these two categories to be meaningful, we looked at, the, at them in conjunction. Um, and that gives us um, a very interesting picture. Uh, and we were able to identify several groups of countries depending on the, the, the combination of depth, the value of benefits and breadth, the extent of coverage. So what we've concluded based on our data is that only a few countries combined generous benefits with wide coverage. Um, and these are high income uh, countries of Japan, Korea, Singapore. Uh, and the main reason for this is that they have developed uh, generous social insurance provisions. Uh, these are broad based and they cover the majority of the populations. Uh, they also are able to provide generous benefits. Now, the main category in Asia, uh, that, that sort of comprises most of the countries in our study is the second category of countries that offer small benefits, but have, have achieved high coverage. So these are the countries that have established universal coverage or moving or progressing towards closing the, uh, the, the coverage gap, uh, both in health insurance and in pension insurance. And I've listed some countries here on this slide. So, so Thailand, Philippines, uh, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Mongolia have been uh, very, very bold in their attempts to, uh, to universalize their social insurance. There are also countries that have expanded their social assistance. Um, and, and these countries, uh, again, they managed to cover a uh, greater number of people. However, they kept the benefits low. And what we conclude is that uh, there surely there must be a trade-off um, Given budget constraints, countries uh, cannot afford uh, spending equal amount of money on, um, on improving adequacy of benefits and improving coverage. Therefore, the trade-off is about ensure that there are arrangements in place to, to cover the majority of the population and then allow for incremental rises in the value of benefits as the country's growth progresses. Now, Another category are countries that provide generous benefits, but only cover a very small eligible population. And these are mostly countries um, that cover uh, more privileged workers in the formal sector uh, and the civil service um, through pensions or health insurance. Um, and, and they provide rather generous benefits to this small subgroup of the population. However, the, the, these countries have large pockets of inequality and, and the majority of their populations who are employed in the informal sector are not covered by social insurance. In social assistance, there are, again, there are countries that provide uh, relatively generous benefits, but only to small um, subset of the population and and you can see why this is happening in countries such as Japan Korea because social assistance obviously is a is an instrument of last last resort and the majority of the population receives uh, support through social insurance and finally uh, several countries have low benefits and have low coverage in both social insurance and social assistance um, so one conclusion here is that one has to be very well aware of the existing coverage gaps, and that should be the key priority in, um, in, in looking ahead. At the same time, the, the value of benefits remains a key feature that determines the, the effectiveness of social protection to help the poor and vulnerable, and that should also be high in the policy agenda. Um, so now let's look at the uh, distribution of the SBI according to these different dimensions, uh, poverty, gender, and disability. Now, um, the S uh, social protection spending in Asia clearly favors the non-poor of the, 
over the poor. So you can see the value for the known poor uh, is 3.2 uh, as opposed to uh, 0.8 for, for the poor. Uh, and there is a rather large gap between those two. Now, one reason for this is that, uh, again, the higher spending on the known poor is primarily conditioned by contributory social insurance that, um, that, that are not um, that, that do, they're not given to individuals based on their poverty status, but they cover people depending on their contribution and in the countries that have achieved universal coverage, they're broad based and therefore they cover both the poor and non poor. Now, spending on social assistance is also limited, uh, and that means that the, the, the value for the poor in the SPI uh, is not significantly enhanced by the, uh, by, by the spending in social assistance. Um, and, and again, one conclusion here that um, social protection needs to be made more pro-poor, uh, and one way to do this is to continue extending coverage and ensure that the existing systems are broad-based and cover the majority of, of the individuals in um, in these countries. So looking at the gender dimensions, uh, gender dimension here, we have an equal split. And this is good news because uh, looking at, 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 the, uh, at the relationship uh, historically, we know that the gap between spending on men and women was much, much more pronounced in 2009. Um, and, um, and, and this is a, the, the, the reduction in this gap and um, a sort of more egalitarian outcomes are there because the, um, because again, because of the development in establishing broad-based social insurance schemes that are given to both uh, men and women in countries with universal social insurance. The, 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 it's important to recognize that yes, the social protection um, uh, social protection be is becoming more gender sensitive across the region, but more needs to be done to support gender equality. Um, and uh, it is also important to ensure that uh, individual programs and systems have gender uh, as, as a cross cutting theme and, and gender is mainstream um, at the level of um, individual programs. So here you can see the distribution of the SPI by gender uh, uh, in um, individual countries of Asia. And then finally, the disability dimension. So here we looked at uh, the SPI for, uh, for people with disabilities for 26 countries um, and, um, and the SPI was 0.5 out of the overall uh, uh, SPI of 4.0 that I presented earlier. Now it's a small share of SPI, and this is uh, this is expected because uh, people with disabilities they they constitute a smaller proportion of the overall proportion uh, overall population. Uh, and we also uh, observe that spending for disability targeted programs has increased. Um, in the region from 2009 to 2018. Um, this is good news. Um, most countries in Asia provide, have at least one disability related program. Uh, and these are often classed under social uh, insurers. So it could be pensions for people with disabilities or they could be under social assistance. Now, again, these are, um, these are small steps and a key policy priority is to ensure that um, there, is the, there is an adequate policy framework that can ensure adequate inclusion of persons with disability um, and more targeted programs are needed, but also expanding coverage can also help to, to cover individuals uh, with disabilities, um, as well as improving the adequacy benefit uh, to con considering specific disability related costs can ensure that they receive adequate support. My final section in this presentation is, 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 is on the, the, the results of our uh, data analysis on COVID-19 and responses, uh, policy responses in Asia. Um, and, uh, and here we, 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 we gathered 
data as part of this exercise. Um, a lot of this was based on estimates because obviously it was very hard to get um, uh, records on particular spendings in Asia and a lot of our national experts, um, a lot of times our national experts had to provide estimates. Uh, however, based on this information, we can conclude that um, there was an increase in spending across Asia. Um, uh, so 2% of GDP on average was spent uh, on emergency spending in Asia, and that goes, uh, uh, that, that, that goes down to 1.2 if we exclude the high income countries. And the existing measures that were introduced, mainly introduced in social assistance, uh, these were cash transfers, uh, and a lot of it was happening around uh, expanding coverage and uh, topping up the value of benefits within social protection. Uh, some measures in social assurance and labor market programs, but they uh, constitute only a smaller share in the overall portfolio. Uh, and just to conclude, some of the findings based on our analysis uh, are very much looking ahead and, and, and trying to to, 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 to use the momentum to actually expand social protection systems would be a key prerogative at the moment. Uh, we do know that the pandemic has exposed the existing vulnerabilities, and at the same time, uh, most countries in the region have expanded spending on uh, social protection in order to help people with vulnerability and everyone who was affected by the crisis. Now, this is the time to ensure that the, the spending levels accelerate. Um, it is also important to ensure that uh, shock responsiveness remains institutionalized within the existing social protection systems. Um, so these are the, some of the key findings and policy recommendations. And again, um, you can have a chance to read more about our findings and our conclusions in the report that will uh, be out uh, this autumn. Um, and you can, as I said, you can also look at our graphs and um, some of the um, uh, some of the information I've just presented uh, on this slide at on uh, socialprotection.org after this session. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Bob, for this uh, presentation and and for sharing with us the findings and the modestly good news in terms of modest progress, especially in terms of expansion of social insurance, but still, I, I think, uh, uh, some way to go in terms of social assistance, pro-poor, but positive in terms of the gender lens. So, so thank you very much. Um, I will just reiterate, please, uh, participants, there is a Q&A box. Uh, we would love to have your questions. I'm sure that you may have many questions coming up. Please write them down and we will try to answer them at the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Now, I will pass on to uh, Nuno Cunha, who will be presenting the chapter on data collection and the importance of data in monitoring progress. Uh, made. So over to you, Nuno. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, and thank you to all participants in this in this session. I mean, I would not uh, obviously be talking about the results today. I mean, it's kind of a different. I'm not going to talk about ex the situation of social protection, but more about a topic that I've been working particularly with my colleague Valeria Nesterenko from, from social protection that works on, on st in statistics. And we have been, I mean, because part of our work is indeed looking at statistics and data, we have been thinking what could we do better? And to start, the first point was to look at, okay, let's see first what we do already and why is it so important? And we, and this is also a discussion we have been having with Mikhail and Wendy and other colleagues at ADB, we thought that it could be an interesting uh, chapter for, for the, 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 the new publication. I mean, I think, well, I mean, when I look at the list of participants, uh, many of you, your, your job is actually to look at social protection systems and the importance of data is not something that I need to, to explain today. I mean, whenever we look at, at any social protection system, and we are evaluating it independently of which angle we are looking at it, the first thing we always say is, oh, 
it we need this data what data can we have access what what and that is key the the quality of administrative data the quality of survey data is essential for us to understand where are we where is this system currently and we just saw the last presentation is a lot about comparing or comparing expenditure comparing coverage and this is essential where when we are looking at systems and we want to understand the gaps that exist which which gaps exist in terms of coverage which gaps exist in terms of adequacy of benefits we need to have data from the value of the benefits we need to have some national benchmarks to be able to compare it uh, but we also need to be able to project to look at the future and we need also to understand how is the funding done where the money comes from to to assess for instance the fairness of systems and, and all these dimensions and then we need to understand what do people need what those that are not covered what are the needs uh, what are what can be the priorities because we we live in a world where resources are scarce and we need to direct them properly um, and of course, this is what will inform policies, and it, it's very hard if we are informing policies and if we don't have good, good data. How can we, we, we convince those that need to take the decision if our pro proposals, policy proposals, if our design pr proposals in terms of design are not based in good data, if we cannot estimate what impact we can have, all these elements. And a good example is actual evaluations where we need to look at the future, we need to be concerned with the financial sustainability. And of course, I mean, I'm gonna jump because I only have 10 minutes, but I mean, as all actuaries will, will tell, I mean, the, you can only get good results if you have good data. If you have, gar if, if you have, if your data is not good, you're gonna get garbage out, the garbage in, garbage out is how they, explain to it and that's why I, I brought the idea of actuarial and also the importance of doing projections because when we're looking at social security systems is not only about what we can pay today but also what we can and how we're going to be able to pay in the future in addition there is also currently we have everyone knows about the sdg 1.3 and all and the indicator that is associated with it in my view it's an opportunity because we share all uh, uh, we share all these among different institutions but also un countries un member states they also need to provide information and it is this provides a good benchmarking in my view to agree in some sort of indicators but here on this slide i also have these two two uh, little characters that are actually talking about the dimension that for me is important that is comparison I mean, whenever we travel and we have missions to countries, we always hear these questions, but I'll tell me more about how other countries are doing. Do you have an example of a country similar to ours that has already a program like that? Or how much is our other countries spending on how, which is the contribution rate, which is, oh, and it's, it's, it's a very important function in my view of statistics is also this one, because countries, they don't, nobody wants to look bad when comparing, for instance, with their neighbors or with countries with the same level of economic development, then again, these, these kind of exercises we do, like the one that was just presented before me, it's also very relevant in my view to create this kind of, I mean, I, I didn't want to, to, to use the word competition, but probably is actually the right word for this. And I think this is another important, maybe not direct, effect of good statistics, but uh, an indirect one that I think we should not underestimate. And that's why, I mean, uh, for me as a regional specialist who travels from country to country, I keep being asked about information about other countries. And it's not only in, in our own country, but it's also the power of statistics to move things in a regional or even global, global level. I mean, that availability, this is not my area, this is much more Valeria area, but I mean, you see, we have, we have, I mean, when we look at SDG 1.3, we have 42% of the countries with enough information to cover most of the, the SDG components. I mean, the different that are related mostly with the different nine branches of the, the social security uh, 102 convention, they, I mean, with the different branches of benefits. Um, we have 20 countries that have uh, updated information, mostly accessible online. But to be to be frank with you, 
I mean, it's very hard for most of the countries. That's the practical experience of trying to produce this data. The same experience actually that ADB had and that I discussed a lot with Mikhail in the last years about how, what can we do better to make it easier, to make it, to make it more efficient and also that we don't bother countries all the time to fill these forms and, and to provide us information. But unfortunately, the situation is that there is scarcity of data available many times and, and, and easily accessible. And then, of course, we have few number of countries with data that is availability and disaggregated by gender. And time series is also another big problem in, in the region that would allow us to measure much better progresses. Uh, when it comes to, to, to social protection expenditure, it's also a problem for, for us in some countries to find the data, but also to understand the data that is available. That is a big, I can, this is my experience more than actually having, I'm not usually looking for the data, but much, much more when, when we get the data and we try to understand the data is really not always easy to understand the data. This slide is mainly about the, 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 complex machinery of the ILO in terms of, of processing and compiling and an, uh, analyzing data. I mean, we, we are in charge of providing and, 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 and validating data related with the, the, the SDG 1.3, then it's, it's, we, 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 take, we start, of course, mostly receiving data from institutions, from administrative data. Many times we have to help countries to conciliate and to to, 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 to bring that data in the formats that uh, for this sort of analysis we do. Then we combine this with, in particular, with use SSI. We collaborate with ESA because they have their own process of collecting data. Uh, we have also data from uh, ILO STAT. I mean, with labor force data and all this information that can be found from that side, combined, of course, with data from many other, uh, uh, many other um, institutions and of course in this region we, we, we benefit a lot from exchanges and discussions and access to data from ADB we have then and then with all these data cleaning and I tell you it's quite a it's quite a tough process we have now all this data available on the world world social protection database many of these data can be it can be uh, accessed online. I mean, you can you can also have then analytical reports like the World Social Protection Report is the most known, but there are more. Uh, and we you have that dashboards by country, by topics. I mean, it's like trying to make data more and more easy and accessible. Challenges, I mean, I mean, I have one minute. Challenges, different definitions. I mean, within countries, between countries, but also between institutions. That's one of the reasons why I wrote this page. I mean, we have different data sources and, and very lack of, lack of instruments. I mean, countries might have a lot of good administrative data, but it's very hard to get to a country and to say, okay, here is all the data we have in social protection consolidated. And we think there could be, it's, it would be, it will not be so difficult maybe to do it if we put all our energy together. I mean, lack of coordination in many processes, different ministries in charge uh, and, and not proper dissemination. Way forward, I think we can benefit from more coordination and collaboration. I mean, we linking the work of different institutions, both at the national, but also regional, and also in terms of international agencies, we can work more on standardizing some conceptual definitions and methodologies. We think and we discussed and we tested this with ADB, probably a tool like the SSI could be a good tool to collect information because maybe we can have different methodologies to do our calculations, but the two, the data that we collect might be actually very similar and we could use a tool in, and then we could share the information from this tool between different institutions instead of every time reaching to our countries. Um, and then, I mean, to close, because I'm already 30 seconds be, beyond my time, just our discussion with ADB, our idea is actually to move towards a regional partnership on statistics, starting maybe with some piloting of data, joint data collection in some countries, but also training and developing capacities and tools at country level that the produ production and provision of statistics is more automatic. And with this, I apologize by one minute longer than what I thought, but I hope it will not get a big delay in the overall. Thanks very much. Over to you, Jessica.
Thank you, Nuno, and thank you for the presentation. And I have to say that the first time I saw the slides on, on how many countries are reporting and have available data, I was, I, I was actually quite shocked. And then when looking at gender disaggregated data and time series even more so. So definitely, I, I think a, a good start and thinking how to move forward. We've also have had experience in trying to identify what data do we use and this issue of different definitions and methodologies also uh, is something that I think we need to explore uh, at the regional level. Anyways, thank you very much. I will now go on to our two uh, discussions. First, I will pass on to Ludovico. Over to you. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, um, yes, I want just to make a, a short uh, reflection on uh, actually very much linked to what uh, Nuno was, was saying. Uh, so if you can go to the next uh, uh, slide. I will just uh, say something more about why data is important and then give a, a quick overview of what uh, international databases are available uh, on social protection in developing countries. Um, and then see how these are useful to measure the key dimensions of, of social protection and what are the strengths and weaknesses of different databases. And then I would like just to uh, uh, finish with one um, reflection on, on what we could learn from other regions and in specifically from, from the European Union. So why data is important? Uh, well, Nuno already uh, said something about that. Uh, we want to say that uh, effective policies uh, require information and Really, uh, one example of, of this is uh, in, in recent work that I'm doing in the Philippines is on uh, disability data. Uh, the Philippines has actually been one of the uh, uh, pioneer country in Asia, uh, recognizing the rights of people with disabilities. But often this uh, 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 right, unfortunately, um, and this recognition of rights uh, is uh, undermined uh, by the lack of a lack of data and specifically um, there are uh, in the Philippines uh, uh, the, the Philippines issue especially a special ID card for people with disability that gives uh, entitlement to different uh, discount and access to, to services but this uh, um, information is still scattered across different municipalities who use, which use different uh, uh, definitions and uh, uh, um, uh, methodologies. And there is a lack of a national database that would allow uh, then the budgeting of these uh, uh, services uh, in, in a more appropriate way to, to make this, uh, these rights real. So this is a, a, just an example of how the lack of data uh, uh, results in, in, a, 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 in making the policy not as effective as it could be. Um, similarly, uh, the lack of data often affects the way in which certain economy, economic theories are, are, are developed. And uh, uh, two examples, really, uh, the fact that there is this uh, often association between uh, uh, the fact that cash transfer creates work disincentive. Now, emerging evidence consistently show that this is um, really not, not the case uh, in developing countries, but the lack of data up until now actually managed that uh, uh, connection to be uh, strengthened and is the first thing that many policymakers have in mind. Uh, similarly, there is of, often a, an assumption that the welfare state is a barrier to economic uh, growth. Again, this is uh, uh, still uh, something that is uh, uh, not backed by, by data. So if we go to, to the next uh, uh, slide, uh, we see that 
uh, unfortunately, uh, on a international uh, level, comparable data on social protection is, is uh, scarce. Uh, ILO provides the most comprehensive source of information on legal coverage. There is the ASPIRE database that is compiled by the World Bank, which is uh, has a strong focus on, on um, household survey data and, and their analysis, but is limited uh, to social assistance. Then we have, of course, as we have learned today, the ADB SPI, which provides a, a, a very good and consistent information on, on social protection uh, expenditure. Um, Latin America with, with a, a CLAC uh, provides a, a database on non-contributory uh, social protection. And then there are other uh, smaller databases that are even more focused on, on certain aspects such as the uh, help page database on, on social pensions. But if we go to the, the next slides, um, we can see that uh, the information that, that we would like to, to have is on one hand, uh, the size of the overall uh, social protection sectors in terms of expenditure, but then understand how many people are, are covered, what is the percentage of, of, of people that are covered, what is their, uh, uh, the, the amount of benefit that they receive and whether that is adequate to cover uh, certain risks and then to what extent social protection is comprehensive across uh, the different risks. So these are the four key dimensions that we would like to theoretically measure and we have seen how um, the SPI uh, actually go about covering these different elements. But we need to recognize that there are a number of challenges. So if we go to the, to the next slides, in terms of uh, social protection expenditure, we still have a, a lack of a consensus on a, 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 a definition of social protection. And this, is, um, um, uh, this lack of a definition is also uh, compounded by the fact that in many countries, social protection is fragmented across different institutions and ministries. And, and that makes more complicated uh, the, the measurement also of all the uh, indicators related to social protection. Coverage is often uh, challenged by the artificial separation across different uh, social protection components so that if we focus on one of the uh, uh, social protection components, for example, uh, social assistance, and we measure coverage within social assistance, we fail to recognize that there is a complementarity between social assistance and social insurance in achieving coverage. And uh, uh, although we, we, we speak uh, of adequacy uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, measurement, a key dimension of, of, of social protection, what we often uh, end up measuring is essentially the amount that is given. Uh, and that's realistically what can be, uh, can be achieved. Uh, but adequacy should also contain other aspects of uh, such as the duration of, of, of uh, uh, social protection provision, to what extent uh, 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 the support addresses the needs of people, the predict predictability on, on transfer and, and so on. And it's difficult to agree on a, a, a really a definition of adequacy and then also uh, have the data that allow us to, to measure adequacy. Uh, comprehensiveness is also uh, complex and is definitely linked to the way in which we assess uh, needs. Ultimately, these four dimensions have the objective of understanding then to what extent social protection helps uh, development and, and poverty reduction. And for this, 
uh, is fundamental also to uh, link the analysis of administrative data with uh, household surveys. If we go to the next slide, we can see that the SPI uh, provides a number of significant uh, contribution. Um, I think the, the way in which the, the SPI is able to address the uh, challenges in, in definitions and in different uh, institutional uh, settings across, across Asia is the fact that there is a team um, that, uh, of national consultants that is involved in this exercise, have a similar training, and then are able to understand the national system to uh, measure uh, consistently social protection expenditure and then do that across different uh, 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 components of, of social protection. And gradually, uh, since the exercise started in 2005, it is not only providing a, 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 a cross-section, but also a, a time series that uh, evolves in a, in, in a panel data that allow us to really potentially start to analyze the uh, changes over time and open a new uh, avenue of, of analysis. And finally, uh, um, the SPI has been uh, um, really um, advancing and pushing uh, information on, on sex disaggregated data and now information also on, uh, on coverage for people with disabilities. And really further improvements uh, could be achieved by uh, complementing the analysis that is currently primarily based on initiative data also with, with household surveys. And in my final slide, uh, I really just want to uh, set as a provocation or, or, or an example, uh, the case of Europe uh, that provides potentially an inspiration of also what could be achieved uh, in Asia. So in Europe, uh, since 1990, there is the a, a mutual information system of social protection that has ensured the communication and uh, harmonization of classification of, of, of different social protection expenditure. And this is uh, complemented by information on institutional settings, uh, program features, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, household surveys that follow similar uh, definitions. And so they are comparable and uh, allow also to build a, a tax and benefit a micro simulation instrument that then assess the effectiveness of, of social protection in terms of poverty reduction and, and inequality reduction. And this has been really instrumental in informing uh, social policy uh, in, in European countries. It's been a long-term investment, but uh, um, uh, it, it, now it, there is possibility to, to reap the, the, the benefits of, of this investment. And I believe that in future, uh, um, something similar could be uh, could be achieved uh, in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank I you, yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Perfect and great and, and, and really nice to also have an example, I think, of how um, we can move towards harmonizing the classification and better comparisons. Uh, so, so great to have that. And I hope this also triggers a lot of questions from our audience and participants. So please do share questions. I, I think there's so much to ask on, on the different uh, data and how we, the definitions, the approaches, we know there's the World Banks there that we use the social safety nets. We know the ILOs not SPI. So if you need any clarifications, this is also a good moment to ask as we have many of the experts with us. So thank you, Ludovico. We will now go on to Enki, who will be sharing an example from Mongolia of data collection and some of the opportunities and challenges. Over to you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, thank you, 
very much for these webinar organizers and also for the presenters. And they already highlight the importance of the social protection monitoring data and statistics. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the, the, the social protection indicator uh, uh, data and statistics uh, over time, because uh, I've been participated in a several rounds of the SPI. Uh, uh, this 2018 SPI was the fifth round in the country, and I started participating from 2009. And uh, uh, this data collection of the SPI and uh, the report writing and analysis, uh, the first, I just wanted to share steps of the SPI compilation. The first, we have to collect the secondary data, available data, and there is a SPI sheet so we can aid and uh, so the result automatically uh, came out. But in order to have the SPI result, it's really important to have uh, uh, concrete and reliable data. So the first uh, 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 work is really on collecting the reliable data. So in terms of, of the expenditure and number of beneficiaries data, it's uh, really accessible in Mongolia. So I will uh, highlight in the next slide. And uh, also you, you, uh, from the Bob's presentation, we have seen that uh, the SPI is generated by poverty, gender, and disability. So for in order to have these indicators, we have to work on, uh, on the household socioeconomic survey. So, uh, so I will uh, talk about the, challenge, the achievements and challenges uh, in the next slide. And um, so since the Mongolia has been participated in the several rounds, now, now we have like four or five rounds of the SPA results. So it's really good to see the comparison of the results and what was the challenges and what we have done good and what needs to be improved. So there is a, now is like a quite, a, uh, the, uh, quite, not, a quite big data is available for to see the dynamics. And, uh, and also one of the thing for this SPI data collection is really uh, uh, in order to have reliable data and also for this generating this disaggregated data, it's really important to consult, uh, to have a consultation with the implementing agencies and the ministries. So that is the, I think uh, I've seen from the participants, there are a number of also national con consultants to, who worked on this uh, national uh, data collection. I think we have already did the same, uh, steps we followed the same steps yeah okay next slide so there are uh, several uh, players in the social protection data and uh, statistics in Mongolia the main uh, player is the uh, the ministry of labor and social protection and the ministry has two agencies main agencies the one is the general office for social insurance and General Office for Labor and Welfare Service. So they compile all the statistics on insurance and welfare every month. So it's accessible to get the expenditure and number of beneficiaries data every month, quarterly and yearly. And they compile and then send data to the National Statistical Office. And there is a statistical information service is available now in online we call it 1212.mn. It is the main source for SPI, particularly for expenditure and number of beneficiaries. And as I worked for several rounds, I found that although there is a uh, online data is available, but uh, we really need to have good the verification of data with the implementing agencies because this data quite often uh, not major, but minor changes is 
uh, always uh, uh, made in the website. So uh, I think it's really good to talk with the uh, implementing agencies. Okay, next slide. So um, as Ludo uh, said, this household socioeconomic survey is important. So um, in this uh, simple table, you can see that uh, uh, for this SBI disaggregation for poverty gender, we used till 2012, first three round, we used the assumption and 2005 with the ADBTA, uh, the Mongolia uh, developed social protection models. Well, there is there were model, but we uh, uh, work to renew and uh, tested new model. And first time in 2018, the household socioeconomic survey uh, collected information on improved model on social protection. So this 2018 SPI has more, uh, mm, uh, more targeted uh, uh, indicators using the household socioeconomic survey. Even for the disability, uh, the Mongolian so uh, household socioeconomic survey used Washington group simple questionnaire. So it was, good to uh, analyze the social protection indicators using this new model. So this is the one of the, uh, the improvement which we have done uh, over the process uh, collecting data and, uh, uh, yeah, and analyzing. Okay, next slide. So I just wanted to say a few words about the challenges and improvements. So we all heard that all indicators are very important for monitoring of social protection programs and policy making in Mongolia. So I've been working with the ministry and implementing agencies to asking the verified data and trying to advocate the, all these social protection indicators. So now they are uh, using some of the results for the policy uh, revision, because there are a quite a number of policies are under revision, like social Mongolian social law on social insurance and social welfare are under revision. And uh, so it, there is a need to have very uh, good social protection uh, indicators. The one of the achievement uh, in Mongolia is the National Statistical Office, this statistical information service. It provides many indicators. And uh, as I said, it should be improved, particularly for the data quality and inconsistency, but not major, but there is some still needs some improvements. Uh, during the calculation of the SPI since 2009, we had problem in Mongolia on the double counting of beneficiaries. So this can be used using the solved using IT infrastructure and databases. There are quite a number of databases are available, available now in Mongolia because uh, when we collect the data, even now, if we uh, if we go to this twelve twelve mn, the the country has a three million population, three point four, but the number of beneficiaries of social health insurance because it's a universal, and it says number of beneficiaries is seven million, even double double counting. So which means that uh, uh, there is a double counting of beneficiaries. They, they don't count individual beneficiaries, they count the number of beneficiaries receiving by service. So that was the biggest problem in every year counting in Mongolia, but uh, we did uh, with the international consultants, some modification using the total population for the universal programs because the beneficiaries were higher than the total population. 
Okay, for this SBI and in general, this government officials awareness and capacity building is very important. I think in Mongolia, we have now uh, people started to aware of this SPI and also the, the capacity of the National Statistical Office, especially this disaggregation of analysis using the household socioeconomic survey is very important. And it's good to hear from Nuno that uh, they are going to start some piloting. So I hope Mongolia will be covered and benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Enki, uh, for a great presentation. I think it's always good to also see how this happens at the country level and how important it is also to support the capacity building process, especially in terms of the quality uh, of the data produced. So, so thank you very much for that. We have now a few moments for uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I, I've, I see just a few questions, which is surprising given all of the incredible presentations. Maybe people are a bit shy, so please do not feel shy, especially when we talk about data maybe uh, to come in. So I will first go and ask uh, a few of the, the three questions and, and pass it on to my presenters and then um, and then we'll open up for another round of questions if we still have time. So the first question uh, from Nadim is, uh, how can we explain that social protection in Asia is more uh, oriented to the non-poor than the poor segments of the population? Uh, so this is the first question. The second question to, again, I think it's probably to Babkin again, to you is going to be to how do we increase coverage? And it's always this area, what, what would work for uh, Asia and Pacific? Is it a, a moving towards more universal approach and programs or moving to more po poverty targeted programs? And the last question for Ludovico is in terms of disability data challenges. Do we have data on social protection and management of children's priorities at household level among social protection programs beneficiaries? So really looking at uh, in terms of what are the needs of children with disabilities. So oh, oh, over maybe you, Babkin, and then Ludovico, but I will also open, I think the question is uh, uh, open also, especially the universal coverage programs and poverty targeted to others who wish to come in. Over to you, Bab. Thanks very much, Jessica. And um, so to answer the first question, why uh, Social Protection Asia covers more uh, the known poor than the poor is uh, the main reason is because of the, the prevalence of social insurance expenditure. And as we know, so well, there are two reasons here really. So one is social insurance is not a targeted mechanism. It doesn't seek to identify people at a certain income level to target them. Social insurance is given to ind individuals based on their contributions. And obviously there are innovative methods, um, the financing mechanisms to, uh, to cover um, the contributions for those who are unable to pay them. However, what happens with social insurance, especially in the countries with broad-based coverage, is that they cover the entire population of the country, which obviously includes both the poor and non-poor, and non-poor having a greater share in that population. In the countries where you have um, narrow fo narrowly focused social insurance countries, they also tend to cover the Non poor more than the poor because these are the schemes that are very much designed for people working in the formal sector, um, uh, public sector, civil uh, civil service, and so these are individuals who are not poor and they they're able to provide their contributions. And the majority of the poor are um, who are working in the informal sector are not covered. So that explains why the the overall results indicate greater leaning towards the um, expenditure for the non-poor. So, uh, and then just to cover the second question as well, I think this is a great question because it, it actually goes to the core of our findings and recommendations. And 
the core of social protection in general. Um, wh wh what's the interest in, 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 in extending uh, coverage? Um, there is various reasons because social security is a, a, a fundamental human right and individuals have the right to, um, to address their um, they, um, to be able to have the right to, to uh, have basic income security because, um, because income security can enable to promote human development, can help us reduce exclusion, to, to, to help um, uh, promote inclusive growth. So there are various reasons, both moral, uh, social and economic, that, um, that provide a basis for extending coverage of social protection. Now, I wouldn't really put a dichotomy here in terms of universal or targeting, because when we're talking about universalism here, it's very much about a systems approach where different programs complement each other. And the idea is that um, all vulnerabilities uh, 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 that individuals face throughout their life course should be covered by uh, different programs. Uh, and that's what we mean by universalism. And that doesn't necessarily mean that targeted programs should not exist. In fact, in Europe, we have programs that are called minimum income schemes that are targeted. However, they're provided to all individuals who experience deprivation. In other words, they're not incomplete. They do not cover only a smaller portion of the poor, as we see happening in the global south. Um, but they actually there's this sort of term universalism in targeting. So they cover all those who are poor rather than a portion of those who are poor. So I wouldn't dismiss targeting at all. And it's, it's, it's part and parcel of the overall system. Um, and I think that we should look at social protection more in terms of complementarities between programs. Thank you. Yes, to answer quickly to, to Chris' uh, question on, on disability data for, for children. Uh, well, in general, the uh, data on disability is probably one of the weakest uh, area, uh, especially because we face uh, specific challenges in measuring disability, first of all. But, um, and within disability for children, there are even more uh, challenges and very few countries have adequate uh, data. But in the case of, uh, of the Philippines, um, uh, through a, a project that is funded by, by UNICEF, um, th there is now an attempt to, to well, uh, there has been basically a study and a survey that is trying to also look uh, specifically at, at the, uh, needs of children with disability and speaking to, to many families to understand uh, what services are, are, are needed. And that uh, will be used then to, to develop uh, hopefully a, a special uh, a response also uh, with social protection programs. But there are definitely ways in which uh, information also on administration uh, from uh, both uh, feedback forms and uh, um, um, uh, in general through the uh, uh, grievance systems can provide information on uh, families' uh, uh, feedback on, 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 on what the specific needs of, of children are. But that is could be the, the instrument yeah, that could be used to, to get more information on this. Thank you so much, Ludovico. I see there is one more question, and then I, maybe I will open also to, maybe to Nuno and Bob Kinnan and Inky for, for wider reflections. Uh, the, the question is how does availability, data availability for the Pacific uh, could be explained in terms of calculations of the SPI? Is data not enough to calculate SPI for the Pacific countries, and how big is the gap? Uh, maybe that. And then I want to, to come back maybe to the mention of how do we expand and, and what we're seeing this trade-off between um, 
between the adequacy and the breadth and the coverage and thinking a little bit the link with the social contract. You had mentioned the social contract in the opposite ways. In countries which are more equal, there is a social contract that supports the social protection, but maybe the opposite also may be possible too in terms of moving towards a more trade, uh, more, more coverage and adequacy to build that social contract. Maybe your, your comments on that. And the last one, maybe to give you another question, is that we have a lot of, um, we were looking at the different uh, countries here in South Asia, and, and one of the questions we always have is looking at the different data, and we have data from from the World Bank and maybe Ludovico and Nuno can come in, where, for example, for, for India, we have over 90% of coverage for social safety nets. While we look at the ILO data is 25% of social protection coverage. I know it's different, but it, you know, sometimes the, it, I think this sort of exemplifies a little bit when people just uh, see the data, uh, how stark these differences can be and, and needing these clear definitions and approaches and understanding on one hand. On the other is the intended beneficiary, maybe for Babkin, the intended, and I'm wondering, for example, um, um, in terms of, for example, uh, for, would a conditional cash transfer such as Indonesia's conditional cash transfer for children or families be a welfare assistance program and would the intended beneficiaries under the poor or would it be the children? So how would that really, because this is sometimes the difficulty for, for or at least for me, I will be very honest to understand how we calculate the intended beneficiaries and maybe others uh, may find that useful too. And then thinking whether the intended beneficiary of a poverty or social as uh, welfare assistance program is only those below the national poverty lines or should it be also a bit above the national poverty line? So, so just sort of questions like that, that come up, sorry. <laughs> so just wanted to add a little bit, maybe food for thought, but I, I also would very much appreciate all of your reflections. Um, uh, so maybe we can go, in uh, a Babkin, and then we can have Nuno, Ludovico, and Enki uh, uh, for those last reflections. Okay, thanks, Jessica. So I'll just pick on some of these questions. So uh, obviously the question on the Pacific, just to clarify that, yes, we do calculate the SPF for the Pacific. In fact, the, 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 the data, the, the results were shared on this platform, socialprotection.com, um, on th last Thursday. Uh, and I'm sure that you could find the presentation on, on their website. So yes, we, we do have the data as a separate report on the Pacific. Um, in terms of um, your question, Jessica, about the, um, the role of social protection in building cohesion, I think it's a great question. And, um, and one can look at social protection as a tool that, I agree, as a tool that can promote greater cohesion and and, and reduce fragmentation. Um, and that happens based on, on literature, that happens in the instances where uh, there is a legitimate state that commits itself to promoting that social contract by, um, by undertaking to deliver uh, goods and services to the population and social protection could be one of those. Um, and I, I personally was involved in a study on um, on social pensions in Nepal. And it was very interesting because as part of the, the research, we're looking at how people perceive the state and, and to what extent um, the fact that you have universal pensions can affect your relationship with the state. And indeed, we found that there was a perception that um, this, it, it, it's sort of it's a manifestation of the state's caring role. Uh, and that has an important effect on how people perceive the you know, state power. And, and in fact, many respondents thought of it as um, that's how it should be. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that thinking, right? Because, and that shows that there is a clear expectation from the state and there is a bond about you know, the state as a provider of um, income security. Um, and then finally, in terms of your questions on the methodology, um, yeah, I think uh, um, just to be quick, all I can say is that, you know, it's a matter of judgment and, uh, and the methodology for the SPI has been 
develops has been developing has been work in progress since since 2005 and i remember i was part of those early discussions where there was you know intensive discussions within the adb as well as with ilo and oecd um so at some point that needs to be sort of some um, some some decisions made about what what should go into the what, how how you would define the intended beneficiaries, and um, so at the moment the way they're defined so welfare assistance is the one uh, program one category of social assistance that incorporates all cash transfer and in kind transfer programs and that includes CCTs that includes conditional cash transfers um, and the intended population group here is the poor and disadvantaged. Uh, and usually the way it's measured is by looking at the, uh, the, the, the share of the population below the nationally determined uh, poverty line. That's the decision. We can, we can, we can talk about you know, how, how far you can go and, and can you actually try to embrace people above, uh, but um, that, that, that's, how, um, uh, that's the basis for this current um, uh, data. Thank you, Bob. And I'm conscious that I took over a bit more extra time. So I will give you two minutes each. Maybe, Nunut, if you want to come in with some last reflections. Yeah, thank you. Then I will try to be quick and to talk fast to see, because there was a lot of interesting things. I mean, maybe I, I will start in a different way, because you mentioned this trade off between the depth and the breadth of social protection. I mean, <clears throat> I'm still to see it. I'm still to see it because I hear this, this rational to justify like the targeting of this proximist tested approach. But if I compare the value of benefits, I mean, look at Timor-Leste with universal pension or, or like Mongolia where I was last week. I mean, it's not the reason why the benefits, it's not because they are targeted that the benefits are higher Then I'm still to be to see that, that rational, that, that trade-off in, in the real world. I think it's much more, the, 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 I mean, it's much more a way of rationalizing resource. When we don't have enough resources to cover everyone, then sometimes this idea of, of, of using uh, uh, proxy necessity is the solution that the governments find. And okay, it's the political, it's, 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 it's the real world. I mean, let's put it this way. As ILO, I see universal, of course, is related with the rights-based approach, but it's also a, like when, especially if we talk about universal schemes, it's kind of a quick path. To, to guarantee this right. But it's not surprising that, for instance, when you look, I, we just did an analysis in Mongolia, the biggest impact is in poverty is actually from universal programs, but also from social insurance, because it's a wide coverage, as mentioned earlier. If it's wide coverage, it has large impacts in poverty. That's that's what we see. If, it, if they are small, they cover 10% of the population. I, we don't see large impacts. That's That's what we observe. In terms of how to, I mean, again, yeah, I, we don't have anything against targeting. Targeting means tested. I mean, it's it's one way of, of course, directing resources to those in need. For instance, but when you don't have that capacity and you use proxies, I have my doubts because that's that's that will erode the social contract because people don't understand. They do, because it's like this kind of black boxes, and this is where I we have problems. And it's an how to extend coverage. I think it's a combination, integration of schemes of uh, contributory, non-contributory, particularly because there is the dimension of adequacy that it's very hard if you only use one tool. Okay, and now I, I to respect the time and your difficult role, I will stay here, but yeah, it, that, that was, it's such an interesting topic for sure to discuss and to spend hours. Thank you. I, I do agree with you, Nuno, definitely. Thank you for pointing out many of those key areas. So I will first go to Ludovico to, to have his last reflections and then, of course, to Enki, and then we will pass on to Marcus. Over to yeah. you, It's very difficult to um, say something. There's a lot of things that have been uh, raised, but what one uh, um, just reflection, we don't have enough uh, data, but there is a, some evidence that if, after every crisis in, uh, um, in Asia, the social protection expenditure has been increasing. And then, uh, as soon as it increase, it then stands uh, to that type of level. So I, I just wanted to finish with this uh, uh, thought that after COVID-19, there will be a possibility to actually further expand uh, uh, social protection 
and uh, coverage and uh, uh, that we have now the possibility to build on a higher level and keep on that one, yeah. Thank you, Ludo, for being so concise and leaving us with this positive note. Uh, Enki, over to you. Okay. Okay, thank you. And lots of good points. And uh, I just uh, would like to say that uh, the, the SPI is now completed and uh, the results are available to share with the government. And uh, because uh, I think uh, it came in right time, uh, because the government is working now on the revision of the laws and policies and they really need good justification and uh, good data. And I will share the SPI results with the government and uh, uh, especially the results of this death and breadth and disaggregation of the data and all will helpful very much for the government. Thank you. Thank you, Enki. And Mongolia always one of those leaders in its field of social protection. So, so happy to hear that this is also moving forward. And then just to say that, I, yeah, okay, I will pass it on to Marcus because I will not be able to summarize. But I just think that it's it's exactly that in terms of trying to find that medium between you know between social assistance and social insurance, looking at it from a systems building and bringing these together. But uh, I will stop, and I'm sure Marcus will beautifully wrap up the session and conclude for us. Marcus, over to you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Distinguished participants, um, it was indeed a great pleasure for the ILO to co-organize with ADB a special session marked by the launch of the ADB Social Protection Index, which the ILO has historically collaborated. Please allow me to congratulate our colleagues um, at the uh, ADB for the launch of such an important publication, but also all the past speakers and uh, discussants for such an interesting session. The data presented today confirmed a very challenging reality. Despite significant economic and social change in Asia and the Pacific, social protection systems remain a relatively residual component of public policy in most countries of the region. Economic gains have in many cases been made in contexts characterized by persistent levels of vulnerability for workers lacking basic protection. We keep indeed assisting a reality in which labor markets continue to be characterized by large informal economies which, uh, with significant social protection gaps. On the eve of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, 1.3 billion informal workers were employed across the region, according to ILO data. Not surprisingly, inequalities in coverage and access to services are still pronounced both across and within countries. Gaps in coverage disproportionately affect the most vulnerable and jeopardize the social contract. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to go further and add, access to social protection is a moral imperative and essential for a future grounded in solidarity between people, communities, nations, and across generations. We concur with ADB's conclusion that it is time to do more and better. Access to social protection is essential for decent work and sustained economic recovery. And it is more than ever needed to enhance social cohesion and social justice. The global call to action adopted by the International Labour Conference in June 2021 reaffirms the centrality of social protection which is at the core of a human-centered recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite laudable progress over the past decades, those rights are not yet a reality for all in Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that countries of uh, the Asia and Pacific region have a track record of transforming crisis into something positive. We saw that back in 1997, we saw it again in 2008. In each case, that included several countries taking the opportunity 
to significantly extend their social protection systems. Many hundreds of millions of people throughout the region are relying upon this. High level commitment by member states to assume prim primarily uh, or primary responsibility for the design, implementation and financing of social protection is essential. We are convinced that we can all be inspired by the many success stories that have come from different countries in the region so that we can forge the future that we want to see and that we have a responsibility to build. We also believe that it is the responsibility of international agencies to, to cooperate and join their efforts in supporting countries in the region to reach these goals. The collaboration between the ILO and ADB in the area of social protection is for us one of the good examples of participation and partnership in the region. In conclusion, we all need to do more, we need to do better, and we need uh, to do it more quickly. We believe this is possible. And on this note, I would like to thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you so much, Marcus, for these final uh, thoughts and leaving us with this call to action. Uh, and thank you all participants for joining us today. Um, and taking the time to listen. Thank you for our panelists for, for the great presentations and reflections. And also thank you to our background, you know, organizers behind the scenes that always make everything work smoothly and wishing you all a good afternoon. And please do remember to um, uh, um, fill out the survey. It will only take a few minutes. Thank you very much. And bye-bye.